Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of In the Fire Garden. I actually forget what episode it is, like seven or eight. The, the number doesn't matter, but I'm here with the great poet Noah Falk, uh, who, and to talk about his book, Exclusions, about Noah. Uh, he's the author of that book, Exclusions, from Tupelo Press, uh, that came out in 2020, finalist for the Believer Book Award for Poetry, which is awesome. And the, rec and the recent chat books, uh, Pre-Recorded Weather, co-written with Matt McBride, which won the James Tate Prize for Poetry, and Normal Normal, a chat book from Foundlands Press, came out in 2022. His work has appeared in the Kenyan Review, Literary Hub, Poetry Daily, Poets.org. He's been anthologized in Poem A Day, 365 Poems for Every Occasion, uh, and various other uh, literary uh, journals that you that you can find. He works at Just Buffalo Literary Center, and in 2013 founded the Silo Reading Silo City Reading Series, which is a multimedia poetry event series inside of inter of interestingly enough, uh, 120 foot high and 100 year old abandoned grain elevator. So That's Noah, right. thank you for for joining us. Happy to be here, Shane. Thanks for thanks for inviting me on and for reading my poems and. I'm thrilled to be here. This is cool. So uh, interesting. I wanted uh, I looked checked into the Silo City, which has been awesome. There's been tons of <clears throat> huge names that have have stopped by there. I wanted to, <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to start with that. Of what what's up? How that that idea to this reading series start this uh, to do it in a grain elevator? What to bring it, to have it in Buffalo, kind of of all places, not a place that that's really you know, it should be on people's maps, but not, I would, I say, wouldn't really be spot uh, pointed out by just any random person as like a big artistic area. Yeah. I mean, this, so the reading series, the Silo City reading series started, uh, actually my friend and poet Joe Hall, um, moved here the same year I moved here in 20 fall of 2012. And we met out for a drink and he was like, Hey man, I got this book coming out from black ocean. Do you, do you know any place in town that would host, uh, a poetry reading. And I was like, you know, I was at these grain silos last week. Maybe we could do something down there. And um, we just reached out to them and the owner, Rick Smith, uh, who owns a, a, a company called Richard Eyes Metals, uh, was cool, was totally supportive of it. And um, so we sort of had Joe invited some friends, various people read. Um, this was May and May of 2013, I think. And we had such a great time. We just said, like, let's keep doing it. And it sort of snowballed into um, a bigger thing versus just like a little party for friends reading poems and playing music. And uh, we got funding and Just Buffalo, where I work, um, sort of helped us put in this sort of support structure for funding and went after some grants. And now we've, we've, we've sort of made a name. Uh, for ourselves. And, you know, Buffalo historically um, is a big arts and cultural space. Like uh, University at Buffalo was a like an epicenter at one point in the late late 60s, early 70s. And all these, all these cultural nonprofits spun out of that scene, which is really amazing. It's a cool spot. You, everybody should come through. That, that is cool because Buffalo is on, <clears throat> on my list of, uh, when I was up in New York. I wanted to swing up to Buffalo. I kind of went up a, a little bit, but then <clears throat> went to out of state. But I was going to ask about <clears throat> kind of the Buffalo scene because uh, <clears throat> online I've seen, you know, I, I saw some people kind of musing stuff over about, oh, where should we uh, like put a, I, I can't remember what press it was, but they were talking about where they can like headquarter themselves basically because New York City itself was too expensive. <clears throat> and but But they're in New York. So they were talking about like, oh, we can do it in this place. And I think Buffalo is one of the places that came up as like a very uh, cool place, but more and more affordable than New York City. So what what's it kind of like the Buffalo scene? The Buffalo scene, um, I mean, the art scene here is very vibrant and it's hard to say exactly, you know, coming out of the pandemic, um, there's a lot of like people, it seems like this is the summer where people are going to sort of fully be back in person and doing things that felt somewhat normal uh, in the before times. And the scene here is vibrant. Like, you know, we have, there's a crazy great artist, like uh, visual arts community. Uh, there's a multimedia arts community. There's a ton of literary folks. There's a, there used to be a, a lot more presses 
um, in town, but you know, we still have a few handful of Foundlings Press, uh, Blaze Vox, um, Peach Mag started here, you oh, know, yeah. Rochelle. I, I Michelle was that. here, but she's, I think she's finishing up her MFA at, at UMass. Um, so there's still a lot of sort of cross-pollination and we're also close to a lot of places. You know, we're three hours north of Pittsburgh, we're three hours east of Cleveland, we're an hour and a half from Rochester, we're two hours from Toronto. So we're sort of in this, you know, three, and like four hours from Detroit. So this sort of the middle of the Rust Belt in a, in a lot of ways, which is, which is good, you know. And I know that people... I mean, it's just sort of changing that that idea in the mind of what Buffalo is because it's a constant struggle to sort of tell us tell the story about we're more than snow, chicken wings, and Buffalo Bills, you know. So it's uh we're on that path to like change that narrative. Yeah, I, I remember Peach Mag now is out of Buffalo. Uh but Buffalo from everything I've seen, you know, just on TV, like you were mentioning the Bills, very passionate. Are is <laughs> is Buffalo as passionate <laughs> then about about like their arts? And and the scene that you that maybe you're more in than the than just the sports fans. Yeah, I mean it's interesting because I also feel like Buffalo is one of those rare cities where the artists are also sports fans. You know, we have our our uh, our you know we watch the Bills games in various garages on the west side and on Black Rock, and uh, so the passion is definitely deep. And I don't know what what the sort of infrastructure where that that well spring comes from um it could be the winters and um and just sort of the the tough skin big hearted um buffalo born thing i'm not buffalo born but like i you know the community's sort of been warm enough to invite me into it um but there is definitely a lot of passion here that's for sure yeah i definitely i feel like i kind of adopt <laughs> i adopted the the sabers a little bit when i when the night <laughs> On because we we sent Tuck over there and I I still love Tuck, uh, but yeah, you said you weren't you're not originally from Buffalo, but having been there so long and worked yourself up into the community and, and done now done so much to start this cool stuff, uh, how would you say that Buffalo, maybe any and it doesn't necessarily have to be Buffalo, but but place in general factors into your writing? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm I'm sort of one of those people who who writes about place um, without knowing I'm writing about place, if that makes sense. I think it just, I'm a, I'm a note taker um, in terms of just writing down images that I find interesting and I collect those images. And so if something's happening outside the window or I'm on the bus and I'm seeing something outside, I'm going to make a note of that. And that sort of landscape just becomes um, a natural part of my poetics. Um, I also think like weather is a big part of how I think about um, landscape in my writing. Like there's always a lot of weather. I'm just sort of fascinated by the different seasons and how people participate in different seasons and what that does to your the human experience. Um, so place is a big part of of um, of how I think about narrative and or non-narrative, I think just image, place and image are a big part for me, yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely in exclusions for sure, because place, while things like, say like landmarks and stuff aren't aren't named in like maybe specific buildings, but the atmosphere, you do a great job of, like you said, with weather to conjure the image, but it evokes, they're so evocative in of, of place, of atmosphere in the small space they take up. Uh, so. With that, with that <laughs> image and your idea of trying to capture an image, and your idea of trying to then express place and through that and get the spirit of like the people and what's around you. Uh, so that's kind of a main idea that you're after. What are it, it? And it's always hard for us to say to like pick out our own tropes that we're, that we're doing and everything maybe, mm -hmm. but what consciously, what do you, what are some things, some ideas that you feel like you're like kind of mo been most engaged with lately, or that maybe you're like trying to shake off a little bit. Cause you feel like maybe you're, you spend too much time with them. Yeah. I mean, I spent a so this book came in came out in 2020. A lot of those poems were written, you know, four or five years before that. And then I sort of tightened the screws on them leading up to the publication. Um and I think this sort of um I got stuck in initially they were sort of these prose blocks, and I was doing like prose blocks for a while, and then just 
sort of obsessed with line breaks and how are line breaks um, directing the reader. And I, so I think, and I'm, I'm really into these short poems. Like, I think I'm just obsessed with short poems, like things that are sort of the sonnet length. I feel like that, that length of time you spend with a poem feels like the right amount of time. Not that I don't love long poems. I'm also obsessed in a lot, in a way that like, uh, you know, the pre-recorded weather book and uh, at another book, you're in your nearly every future were sort of long poems. I mean, they're short poems, but they're all just under the housed under one name, which is another um, another thing I've been doing for a while, which I think is <clears throat> speaks to some of the, the poets I was really into for a long period of time. Matthias Felina uh, comes to mind immediately just in terms of like writing one idea for three years and like housing all the everything you write under this one idea and whether that actually falls under that idea or not it's going to be a part of that project um i'm currently working on another series um the sort of which i need to get out of this is what i'm i need to stop doing this but like i'm writing a series called um you had to be there and it's just like a long again i don't know if it's a long poem but they're all sort of vignettes uh, short, uh, fragmented poems that are nodding to the idea of, you know, these moments in my life or in someone's life that I thought would be cool to sort of relive, um, which in some ways, that's what poems are in some, in some cases where they're sort of these instruments of glimpsing at, you know, what we do as humans and how we, how we take in the world. And that's something that, that I love about poetry and, but I'm going off on a tangent here, but I think that's the that's the thing I've been most obsessed with. And I think I've, I've been using that word obsessed a lot, but I think that that's what poets, some of my favorite, I think that that's what poets do. They obsess over images, ideas, patterns, structure, sound, um, and get it all into one, get it all into one space, you know? Yeah, get definitely. One room. And I, I love that you you brought up that you love the, the short form, because I was actually going to ask you about the long long poems or short poems because funny enough uh yeah this book is all uh short poems uh but your epigraph is from john ashbury who yes. who can who can write the long poem with the best of them so that, <laughs> yes. that's that, that's a fun kind of marriage of of those two and so b before i ask you uh to read some a little bit i wanted to ask you one mm -hmm. thing about uh you have a couple of chat books out uh matt mcbride you wrote with pre-recorded weather and then you mentioned a couple ones that are coming out uh what's what's the difference to you in approaching say like or maybe an idea or how do you determine what's a chat book versus what's a, a regular book do you do you feel like chat books you can be more maybe exploratory of stuff more more radical i, I know there's there's some people that, that love the chat book because they feel it's kind of a more freeing than than commercial enterprise and that yeah mm -hmm. chat books are never going to be big big sellers but that's that's mm -hmm. what makes them best for kind of radical experimentation mm -hmm. that's good i love that i love the idea of radical experimentation i mean i think the chat book to me is is like a great perfect form because you can sit down and read a whole chat book you know in 30 minutes or you know in a very short period of time um in terms of figuring out like what's a chat book what's a full-length project i don't know um the answer to that like i think the last couple of chat books have sort of felt um like you know commissioned in some way like uh aiden at foundlings asked asked me to write poems for this for this uh this project strays and i didn't which I love the idea that the Stray's chapbook project is sort of poems that didn't fit into any other books. And I was like, I don't really have anything. I mean, I do, but I don't like anything that I've written. So let's just write new stuff. Um, and, and then I was, I got so into that rhythm of writing those. I was like, maybe this is a full length. Like, so you sort of, if you like, I feel like the, the difference is if you really like the project, you want to live with that project for a long time. Cause I think a book, at least for me, a book, it takes you know years years and years in a chat book you can maybe write a chat book in a year or something and feel good about it um yeah. but then you also have this idea because I'm, I'm putting together my next book um and there's a lot of parts of different chat books that are gonna i think that are gonna make it into that book so it's sort of like maybe it's it's not exactly five chat books put in under one roof but 
it's you know what are the best what are the poems i like best that i've written in the past five years that are going to sort of also um relate to each other and um speak to each other and and, and be exciting um so that doesn't answer that um but yeah i don't know i don't i don't know what to say in terms of full length versus chapbook i do love the chapbook form um Ultimately, I think it's the perfect form. Just like the sonnet, I think is the perfect form. No, I, so I think the chapbook of sonnets is the next thing, right? No, I think that's a great answer. Like, just it goes on off feeling. I think that's how so many of us uh, kind of make decisions and and have to live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now, if if uh, you're you get, if you have some stuff prepared that you'd be happy to read, I'd love to for you to to share some some stuff from exclusions with us. Absolutely. Poem Excluding Vandalism. The hills fill with hip hop and the last tree blooms through the prologue. At your wedding, at your funeral, we say the same thing over and over forever. All the honest children later become strangers. The locals drink until they are invisible. And as if by habit, sadness arrives. We torture it with a downpour of faith, with kissing noises. Later, we don't know how to look each other in the eyes. Home excluding shower scene. The entire world is room temperature. Sunlight bleeds over the city and the mall walkers gather to form a sort of nervous system or fatigue performance, we say. Consumers storm the sale racks. It sounds more and more like music through pregnant skin. And today, every child is born into whatever space is available. We wait for snowfall, maybe learn another language, a language built around the idea of far, far away. Home, excluding shopping carts. The air moves through the window like it knows something you don't. Imagine the first mosquito. Imagine us baking cakes in the shape of our future children. They look more like mountains in a world without people. Outside, the sky grows up and a single cloud moves over the backyard and rain comes down like jeweled knives in a folk song. Do you like two more or something like that? Yeah, that sounds good. Home excluding birthday. If somewhere had a voice, it would come to us like fog. Yellow fog over a street of gauze. It would feel like the time you took off your shirt and used it as a flag. A flag in the blackout capital of the world. Every memory you have holding your breath underwater in the deep end with an erection. Or when you called my body a surrealist's dream with a kickstand. At a certain age, 
the mine digs for China. And like cold sores, the weather surrenders. Poem excluding fiction. We live in the most fortunate of times. And who's to blame? Our moods, like the four seasons in a tinted window overlooking a bank robbery. Everyone is raising children on cable television, on leashes, on the slot machines that have become our elegies. We live other lives in high school, college, on the porch reading the obituaries. Say, I miss you, into the mirror while shaving, brushing teeth, plucking something that's meant to grow forever. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. I love the way you read those. Uh, and I love that you read the fiction last because that, that actually ties into the question I wanted to ask you immediately in that I think exclusions here can be read as kind of a, a long sequence of elegies and I which I think you give to us because in the, uh, the opening poem fiction you introduce that idea to us telling us about the slot machines that become our elegies a line that I, speaks to me because uh, I love the slot yeah. machines <laughs> yeah you're in, you're in vegas aren't you you're in vegas yeah. yep yeah so i i hear that actually perfectly mm -hmm. and then the penultimate poem uh the poem excluding elegy which is great because it's such a wonderful mm -hmm. irony that it's it, we've read far too much into the book to actually exclude elegy at this point and then the poem itself doesn't exclude it uh being that it's also a fantastic elegy and then we have the end coming after which is a great elegy for you know the impermanence of place of home the passage of time and lament and the wise melancholy that you know we need to recognize acknowledge change adapt to the passage of time all these things so i think the book is is very rich with these philosophical ideas uh but about the elegy which i think you use uh, like you said it's a short form even as well uh, to to really capture uh in this compressed space these these dense ideas uh do you consider yourself an elegist or is this more the work itself kind of call to that and you just ran with it and then your other work you kind of get isn't always so elegiac or is, is like that the elegy like you were saying the sonnet you think is kind of a perfect form uh do you think the elegy is is itself also kind of a, a great mood to operate in oh absolutely i mean I, I think absolutely and i think i just sort of naturally feel comfortable in the in the elegic space um I didn't, I mean, I love, first of all, I also want to say, I love that reading um, that you, the reading of the book you were just describing and, um, and it's very kind and generous. Um, but I think it's, I'm comfortable in those spaces that are, and particularly in this book of like um, the sort of the rolling hills of darkness that, that are, that, are, that, the, that is the world and the, and the sort of the, the huge element of sadness that, um, that is a part of it and part of being alive. I don't mean for the poems to be dark and sad completely. I just think that that's sort of the state I work in a lot um, and try to blend in sort of layers of um, humor, but not la ha ha humor, just sort of um, unexpected um, bits and pieces of uh, of reality that are funny. And um but I, I don't know. I think I, I love the the LG form. I don't. I didn't set out, and I wasn't thinking of that when I was writing these specifically. Um, but it, it's sort of a nod to to that form for sure. And uh, staying with elegy, the poem excluding elegy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only poem that you mention God as God in in uh, public transportation. You say as a momentary God, which is qualified and lowercase so god itself is the, the capitalized uh, deity only comes up in elegy which i think is interesting plenty of other poems mention uh various other religious artifacts we can say like catholic prayer bible poem you have poem excluding religion so there mm -hmm. so v these various uh kind of religious ideas are are, th are throughout but god only is deferred till much later in the book mm -hmm. and which i feel like 
you know, these various other <clears throat> religious uh, spiritual mentions as they come up actually evoke God through their exclusion in that kind of uh, anaphatic, I mean, cataphatic way where we're mm -hmm. getting the, ne the negative through the positive. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, but I, I tend to find metaphysical mm -hmm. stuff in, in all my readings. So I, but mm -hmm. I, I, in, in your book, I was definitely getting that, you know, you're, you're harking to a clear religious background and a recognition of, or at least the religiousness around in, in the world. Uh, but even if that's not adhered to in your part, I, I was definitely reading uh, an adherence to a possible, to the possibility of transcendence, despite the elegy form. Like, like you say, there's definitely hope and yearning in, in these poems. Uh, is that there or, or have I kind of like misread everything? No, I think that, that, I mean, again, I love it. I think also I'll, I'll say that, and you already know this, but I think all, all these, all poems by any poet, is up for these interpretations and like sort of the the initial stance or the 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 work that you put into writing a poem um how that is read or how that is sort of how it becomes its full self is when somebody else reads it and i think that how your your interpretation is is beautiful and and again like generous um i think some of the 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 religious symbolism um and sort of um you know layers in the in the in the poems are sort of um they're not i i mean i'm not i mean i think religion is just such i'm fascinated with religion in terms of like how do you bring the how do you bring religion into space without it sort of taking over um and i think what you know when you bring god into a poem what what are you expecting it what are you expecting to happen um and I think um, the upbringing I had was not religious. I always felt somewhat of as an outsider and not that these are sort of specifically to me, but I think I've, you, you sort of bring in um, maybe subconsciously an awareness of how you participate or how you view um, the inner workings of certain religions and like how that would seep back out into some of my writing is obviously there, but I, it's sort of unintentional, if that makes sense. Like, I don't think I was trying to like, okay, here's here's what I'm bringing God in. God's going to make an appearance like two pages before the book and leave it at that. But because um, that also brings up the idea of like the order of the book and why are these why are these in, in this sort of order? And that's a whole nother thing, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that reminds me just of... Uh... <clears throat> Beckett when he was asked like why he write uh, this kind of a paraphrase but he was asked like why he writes about or with like Catholic imagery, imagery so much and he was just like well I know that imagery so I use it <laughs> that's right that's so, right yeah we just operate yeah like Flannery O'Connor like just have loading all of her short stories with these religious heavy religious symbolism that you could sort of pull out and question on any every other paragraph it's crazy yeah crazy cool crazy cool I love uh, one about the titles themselves. I love that running theme throughout, like poem excluding beauty pageant, poem excluding age. What I love the the kind of uh, fun thing you did with the table of contents was they're just listed by fiction, war, public transportation. The the poem excluding part is not there, so we kind of get they're kind of doubly named, and we, so we get this idea of duality, which I think is inherent to all the poems because the things that you're excluding are just naturally through language invited in there. Uh, so you wrestle with a lot of kind of dualities mm -hmm. uh, in here, the trying to affirm things through, through the negative and all this stuff. What, what were you trying to, not, not like trying to do, but what, what does that say? Like your relationship with, with language and operating in, in the positive versus negative, like trying to, what were you experimenting with, with language, I guess. And like, is it possible to exclude this or how do I, <laughs> just not say something by saying something yeah my question is kind of vague but i mean like what what was no the... no, no. I, <laughs> I, I think i know what you're saying and i think like um <clears throat> almost all poems to me and this may be a, a ridiculous answer in some ways but like our 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 vehicles for experimentation and i think like this book and even though i don't like to call it a project book it's it's clearly a project book um sort of you know, thinking in the project vein, like, okay, today I'm going to write poem excluding 
parking meters or whatever and like just having a list of things so, so when I was initially coming up with the idea for the book I was just writing down images or things that I was coming into daily contact with things that I was either annoyed with or really interested in and in sort of thinking about in a poetic manner um and how that also immediately complicates it like why does it what what is a poem that doesn't have uh fiction in it what is a poem that doesn't have these things in it and and off and that, that also pressurizes the idea that like as you're writing the exclusion, are you specifically trying to leave this out? Um, or are you trying to play with the idea of what is being left out? And I think that was the thing I was trying to most do is like play with the entire idea of like the leaving out and in the leaving out um, or the idea of leaving out, um, what what is the thing that you return to that's left in? And the thing that's left in is sort of the poem. And I think that all of them are, are, are trying to do that and like, highlight these things that are so that's sort of the positive thing is like whatever is in the poem is sort of trying to um convey this sort of positive strike of what a, what a poem can be yeah i love that and thank you for making sense of that of that question i don't know if that made any sense shane <laughs> no it, it, it did it did to me I, I was just after kind of like what your relationship to language was but i was get too in my head about how to how to like phrase it but i love that because that also helped me with ask with like phrasing this other question I had of you know how did you decide <clears throat> kind of what objects were going to initiate uh, be the subject of the poem but that mm -hmm. makes sense in the associative qualities that you kind of listed mm -hmm. like oh here's a shopping cart and then what what are like the images that that, that evokes and all that so that that I think that makes totally. just makes sense of how the subjects were kind of settled on and then what the content that comes after like what is how does this relate to to that. Mm -hmm. Like traveling mm -hmm. down that kind of associative poetic lane we it may we can get totally. there absolutely an associative um writer like and and sort of following the wave of association through until it feels like it's completed if that makes sense not to be not that i'm a surfer in any way i wish i could surf but like i i, be, I truly believe that that's a thing like uh, how you're writing the poem and writing the poem writing the poem into its finish line or to its ending or until it crashes whatever however you want to whatever metaphor or mixed metaphor you want to use there but like um i i try not to um and and i'm, and I'm changing and I'm, I'm growing as a writer in terms of just like how you think about your own processes of composition and like how much do you stress in the actual different phases of writing like i think it's so much more i'm so much more um into the sort of editing and revision at this point in my life than I was you know with my first book or even this book like I was thinking about um you know the sound and the associative acts when I was writing this poem these poems specifically now I'm more interested in like are they saying exactly what I want to say and what is that um and 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 I think that there's different ways of approaching that but I'm I'm really interested in sort of and I think it I think that's just maybe a natural step in 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 my own growth, maybe. But um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently, just with my own processes. Yeah, uh, the, I like that. That the not only does the the writing change with the writer as you know we go through phases, but that you know kind of necessitates that the editing might might change as well and so our craft as much as people talk about craft and we all we talk about craft it, it it's very hard to pin down because the craft will kind of change from book to book sometimes even poem to poem absolutely and i think and i also stressing like the the poets that you are yourself discovering rediscovering obs obsessing over um who you're reading why you're reading them how deeply and closely you're you're reading them and the relationship of how that translates into your own voice um is insanely part of it's just like it's i think that's that's a part of how you become a writer like it's like reading widely um and and like your who you're reading at any point in time i think says a lot um and there's just so many great poets and great books out like how do you find the time and who are you gravitating towards set well you know, ends up these sort, that's why these schools of thought and schools of writing happen. But like, it's just fascinating to me, endlessly fascinating. Yeah. And I like that 
the idea then that as you as you kind of change you can always you kind of keep a toolbox then of a trick of like different styles that you can work with and you are always adding to that so that you know if you get stuck or something's not working you always have mm -hmm. a different approach you can maybe harken back to or that you've learned from somebody else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100 percent, 100 percent. so in in this book who are some poets that you or like you said because you were writing these uh for a number of years uh so kind of in, in that timeline who were some major poets that i'll say that or that you think helped you with with that that you were maybe like heavily uh reading at a time and then now with your who's who are some poets that maybe you've kind of gravitated towards that are doing some some good cognitive work for you right now totally totally um i love this question i'm trying to think like i know that i, I did interviews when the book came out and i probably listed a bunch of people i was reading at the time um I know I was reading um, Charles Simic. Um, he was really important to me early on in thinking about what po poetry could do. Um, and then I mentioned Matthias Felina. His first book was really shook my world. Zachary Schomburg, some of the, like those surreal, those uh, young surrealists. Um, I was reading Mary Rufel. Um, James Tate, um, Mattia Harvey, um, Zach Savage. Zach Savage's first couple of books are really, I mean, all of his books, but I really love Zach Savage. Um, it's so hard and I look around and I'm like, I'm in a room full, a room full of books and trying to figure out what are the right ones that I should name that, that were sort of actually on, on my desk at that time. Um, you know, maybe, maybe Kenneth Koch was there um i remember reading tan lin um his his book uh lotion bullwhip giraffe but his i mean have you read have you read any tan lin he's just no i don't think i actually know tan lin crazy good um I'll look him up after this oh Graham graham faust probably too but also later in the process maybe in the editorial phase of that um yeah that's that's a handful of names and then people who are who I'm reading today, I'm reading all the silo the silo poets this year, uh, Salma Sharif, um, Roger Reeves, and the Bolshevik. Really yeah. Roger Reeves, have you read Roger Reeves' la re most recent one? Oh man, I, I'm I just started the other day because I I finished King Me actually yesterday. Okay, yeah. So he's he, yeah. I'm getting into getting, and I just picked up. Uh, this was recommended for my friend Mike McGriff. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. I mean, and this is also with an intro, uh, edited by Charles Simic. Um, and I'm reading. Uh, do you know Andy Gray? Andy Grace's book Sancta was has been huge for me over the past few years. That was on. Um, well, Foundlings republished it. Who who did they? Asada published that first one, but they went out of. They went under, and that was a shame because that press was just a dream. Um, and then I've. Today I was reading. I'm trying. I try to read like a, a book, not a book a day, but just okay. to start the day with a. Can you see that? Yeah, Gene Fullen. Yeah, totally. I mean, sort of the the sort of miniature poems that I, I, I'm infatuated with. Um, like how 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 can the short poem idea? Like how do you fit an entire world into twelve lines? And then when I say entire world, like the sort of feeling that you get, you're a part of a place. And in that place, things happen that may or may not happen in our world. But like, it's just, I love thinking about that and trying to figure that out. Yeah. And I, I love that actually, because uh, you're, I, I like how in your short poems here that they're, they're all, there's so much symmetry in them and that they're all fairly formally the same and that they all kind of look like they take up the same space. They vary mm -hmm. here and there, but we get this idea of there, there's a coherent, uh length to them and everything but mm -hmm. they're it's deceptive because there's so much <laughs> experimenting going on between them that each one's trying to accomplish something different like some are trying to give us the distillation of an image we can say capture a moment all mm -hmm. these things like that some very <laughs> doing our best with language to compress an instant for eternity and all these things but then there's mm -hmm. others where in that space you're actually trying to <laughs> be more narrative and, and be dramatic mm -hmm. and, and tell a story one that 
that always stood out to me that I love was online dating. Mm. That's mm-hmm. the, exact, the exact same. It's like who, who's online dating and why? Because in that in this poem, we have a mother, we have a father, so they're not dating, uh, but we're not giving we're not given like another character. But there's a mm-hmm. whole missing scene that you describe for us of the house, and we can kind of, and as readers, then we can do all this work to fill in like what their day is like. All this like, is there some? Is there like <laughs> something going on, on the side? Is there another person in the house? So I love that uh, these are all so <laughs> experimental between them, and that you 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 know vary like what you're what you're after. That you tell your like in that poem, you're telling a story, or you give us the you give us the ingredients of a story, and the reader mm-hmm. then is off on their own to make of it mm-hmm. how how it fits in that and then other times it's much more like you know you, you want to be almost like impressionistic and, and just capture the moment sometimes like you the surreal in, influences are there at times when mm-hmm. something completely changes direction for what it was so I, I love how in these you, you seem to you know you're up to something different kind of kind of each time you're really letting the the form kind of breathe uh how do how do you I guess we can say from like beginning to end from when these started to it, it's published, how do you feel about your exploration of, of that form of that, of that short form? I mean, I, I still, I feel good. I mean, I still like, I still like a lot of the poems in here. Are there things that are changed? Most definitely. Uh, but I think that just says that you're growing. Like, you know, when you look back at your old books and, you're like, oh, I can't read that. But I mean, there's still parts of who you are in them. And, um, you know, I think it, pointing back to that sort of just the obsessive act of writing, because I think it really is like, how do you figure out this? How do you figure out this form? And how do you how do you fit yourself inside that form to do what excites you as an artist? And um, and I feel good about these. Like, I think it's... Um, I don't know if they live up to all the poets who I mentioned at all, but like they're they're trying to hold up some sort of mirror in that way, and um, and we'll see. You never know. Time time will tell. Not that it needs to tell anything either. <laughs> it was fun, right? It was really a fun process. I remember. Are there any poems that maybe made it, but you, you know I, that were heavily edited or that you cut completely because maybe you, you just ran too wild with them that they got away from you they got too long or you, you couldn't cut them are there, are there any kind of those moments yeah i mean the first version of this had i think closer to like 75 so there were a lot of poems that didn't make it at all like were just not not good um, or I didn't feel lived in t- or couldn't fit in this space. Cause I think that's another thing I'm going through right now is um, the next book is at this point around 80 pages, but I feel like in some books, like Joe, you know, Joe Hall's recent book, I think it's like a hundred and some pages, in, but my book, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if my book, my books need to be that long um, because, well, and that's a, that's a whole nother thing I'm thinking about. It's like, what, what makes a book how long does it be what is the right pacing for it um are the are you making the right choices the poems you're pulling out um you know so that's sort of that editorial mindset um which is really fascinating but i mean in terms of the book the ones that made in here the only one i that i like to highlight is government poem excluding government because that was i can't remember the decision of is it government? Yeah. Um, why this was left in, but this was a different poem altogether. Like it was under a different title. It was published under, I think published under a uh, temporary tattoo. So it was just like, I'm just going to take this and put it under this title and see if it does anything. And it just stayed in there. Um so that that feels like it's cheating the the whole book, but I liked the poem without any title and sort of just giving it. So that also maybe gives some people an idea of like, well, what is he doing? Are these are these unintentional? Then are they all just sort of random? And I think that that's up to you uh, as a reader to decide. But I think that that's that's the one that I remember. I was like, this is I want this poem to be in a book. Um, I could have held it out, but I, but it stayed in. 
And also, what I found out another kind of fun thing is fun or not fun. Um, in the contents, they left out um, death out of the table of contents, which I didn't know until um, a book reviewer asked me in an interview, like, hey, was that intentional to leave death out of the table of contents? I was like, what? <laughs> I had no idea. I, I thought I thought something was off in my count because I was count because I was I, yeah. I was asking about the length because like oh a very short book but there's only fifty four poems in the table of contents so I'm like that's How's right that? so weird right anyway it's a fun little two below I was like all right I'll let him I don't know if I even told him that but I love that story though because it reminds me of uh, math uh, math in that when so, I forget how it works but there's a way to solve math problems that they call by brute force which is just kind of like <laughs> force the thing because <laughs> it's ugly it's not like yes you're not pretty math and it reminds me of the, like you know for for as art for as artsy people <clears throat> as writers tend to be there mm -hmm. i feel like there's a great deal of brute force behind the scenes of like i want it to work it's gonna work <laughs> yes that's right 100 percent. and i think that i don't know if i would fall into the art artsy for, maybe but i also have like that you know, I grew up playing sports and that's whether that's good or bad. I don't know if I, you know, but like, it's definitely a part of who I am, like the athletic brut bruteness of like locker room BS and all that crap. So it's in there. <laughs> so last, we can say like this kind of a question here, because because I wanted it to be about the, or last ish. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a short collection, 50, 55 pages. So, so very, uh short in space doesn't take up uh much space and like you, you said joe's book which i actually have beside me a uh, few can strike for anybody yes to check that's out great Joe's book that's great his numbered pages go to 117 oh 117 okay yep so, yeah so much a much longer book and there's and kind of longer poetry books yeah i i don't want to say they're becoming the norm because there's still plenty of short ones but mm -hmm. you, you, definitely, you definitely see more kind of published in the 100 page range mm -hmm. now. So I love that yours is is uh, fifty five pages, and like I, I talked about, it, I think it does so much philosophically uh, with the the density of its space. And that, in fact, as I was reading it, the, the I kind of gave it a different epigram epigraph of like the rest is silence from Hamlet mm. because mm -hmm. there's so much silence in this book mm. that uh, is so evocative. Whereas, because I definitely want my bad habit. I, I guess maybe not bad. I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> lead people in one direction or the other. But a habit I have, and we mm -hmm. can say it's bad or good, is I throw everything. I, I have sometimes like I get carried away. And I can throw everything in there, mm -hmm. and, and nothing is silent. Like there's, sometimes there's mm -hmm. no silence, and that can mm -hmm. work sometimes, and sometimes it can not work. But I love the you're embracing of silence and your embracing of we can even say like negative space or white space of mm -hmm. the of the poems and letting just inference and suggestion do so much work mm -hmm. uh, and then like I, I mentioned i think that's great that you use the john ashbury quote from because the, the quotes from the new spirit which is a pretty that's right opinion. so that's right yeah so that that's awesome but so yeah what's you know you're kind of and that's just another dualism in the book but yeah yeah, and you like the short poem, so necessarily silence will be in there. But what's kind of, uh, you know, that that tension between noise, <laughs> I'll say, or verbosity, maybe as a as a more neutral word, versus silence. Like, what, where do you? Uh, obviously, you kind of fall towards the the compact form. But what do you think about your relationship with with that? I mean, I I, I again, I think that's a great reading of it. I mean, I love, I I tend to. Um, think about poetry like capital P poetry as like a space for meditation a space for silence to exist a space for you know like the act of reading is very much like a meditative act for me where it takes me away you know and I think a lot of people it takes you away from your the the regular rituals and routines of your life and like creating space to um I don't want to sound like a like sort of hippie here, but like you know, like spaces that feel sacred and peaceful um, and meditative, um, I think are sacred. And like, and I think there's something about that in the in poetry where it's like, 
um, not to not for it to be sort of overly academic or put on some pedestal, but like a space where you can go like a like in a huge empty field and just lay down. Like I think that that's to me like what a poem is like when you can sort of be embraced by. Um, and maybe I'm sort of alluding to sort of the nature and the weather stuff again, but like I think there's, I I just feel comfortable with that. Like and I think that that's, um, part of how I envision what poetry should be whether that's an actual that whether that's how people feel or not that's something that I just feel comfortable with so that's sort of an and again like an answer a non-answer answer but um there's a comfort in sort of the silence and the sort of empty the you know like you're saying like the white space and and white space is also uh who was it Fanny Howe I can't remember who said that white space is also as a, as a, is as important as any noise that's happening too you know like and in some cases can trump it, you know? Yeah, I love that you brought up the fields and and, med and then being meditative, because of course, <laughs> I think of your line, fields of fields of fields, where, <laughs> you, you know, you kind of get into that, that labyrinthine-ness of it, that just, that that deep, deep inwardness that that silence or or that deep concentration can take you. So I think that <laughs> that you, you do a great job of taking us to those fields of fields <laughs> of fields. <laughs> right. So, uh, coffee in the moonlight right yeah <laughs> yeah do you want to you know uh, close out with us here with uh, another poem or two yeah maybe a couple more poems thanks again for doing this shane this is fun yeah thank you for hanging out find that poem Oh, I'm excluding answers. <clears throat> Someone spends her entire life dreaming of how it will end. It makes her sad. We sail a small boat within her heart and discover another heart. Though it looks more like a moon lit from within by a single exploding bottle rocket. I'll do the uh, the end, poem excluding the end, all those fields. Poem excluding the end. Fields of fields of fields of coffee in the moonlight. Words roll off the tongue and into cities powered by wind and sex by sexy wind. We'll make the most of it. Everyone else will move to New York and later move out of New York and tell stories about their time in New York until New York becomes just another strip mall, until New York becomes just another, oh. Awesome, yeah, I love that. <laughs> So again, uh, thank you no, uh, for stopping by. This is Noah Falk, his book, Out with Tupelo Exclusions, uh, with, uh, in which I will link the, their site so you can purchase the book in the description. And Noah, what are some places where people can find you at so they can send you their loving praise of how awesome this book is that they're going to go buy? Oh, like on the social media and stuff, all those yeah. places? Or, um, or yeah, anywhere you'd like to be contacted. I mean, they you can find the website's probably easy. It's just go to nofalk.org and all my all my stuff is on there. You can find it's like the the landing space or whatever. Yeah, that sounds good. So I'll I'll post your website in the description so everyone who's interested can contact you through there. Uh your book will be linked in, in there as well. <clears throat> and so thank you for stopping by, reading some, telling us uh giving us some insight into your mind and how it functions. <laughs> Total pleasure, Shane. Thanks so much for having me, man. It's a great time. Definitely. And I will talk to you then soon. And right. uh, see everyone for this next episode of whoever else stops by. <laughs> Take care, Shane. See ya.